and welcome to the Afcast Tenerife Afternoons podcast. I'm your host, Tim Dowd. Today's episode will have an interview with publican, hotel manager, restaurateur, tour guide and butcher extraordinaire Mr Peter Quilty, plus the latest on the COVID-19 and the phase 3 de-escalation and the weather afcast for last week. Enjoy the show and don't forget to subscribe. I publish every Sunday night, ready for your Monday morning commute or just start your week off with a little bit of sun. Talking of sun, here's the weather afcast for Tenerife, week ending June 14th, 2020. Like a UK spring day last week, the view of La Gomera was clear most days with a bit of cloud and temperatures in the direct sunlight of about 28 degrees. Temperatures in the shade were in the low to mid 20s, not dropping below 22 at midnight. And in the past few weeks, we ate every meal outside. You'll be able to return to these podcasts next year to find out what the weather was like in a particular week. Great for planning your vacation. COVID-19 update. We've now dropped below 90 active cases in the whole of the Canary Islands. Tenerife has 34 cases and only four new in the past week, but all those were in the northern part of the island. Tenerife Sur has been COVID-free for 16 days in Arona and Santiago del Tede, and over 30 days in the rest of the southwestern municipalities. We've been in de-escalation phase three since June the 8th and plan to transition to the new normal on Monday, June 22nd. Most of the beaches are open again and with physical distancing in place. Restaurants and bars inside and outside areas are still accessible at 75% capacity. Plus, you're allowed to sit at the bar again, with a one and a half metre space between customers. Common sense is prevailing again this week. People seem even more relaxed, but as always, still on their guard. Our pool in the complex has been open since phase two, with a physical distancing and booking system for a time slot, which offering a maximum stay of two hours. Other complexes still do not have the resources to do everything required and so stay closed. Spain's planning to open up to foreign tourists on July the 1st, but there is a new law to create air corridors between northern Germany and some of the Balearic Islands. The safety measures are still not yet in place, but they are finalising discussions between tourist ministers and other European countries to try and find a safe way to accept visitors from countries in a similar state of de-escalation. There is another meeting of the government today, and things may change rapidly. There is talk of opening up the borders to EU Schengen countries in the last week of June, except Portugal, because there is to be a celebratory opening of the Portuguese-Spanish border on July 1st, attended by the king and the political leaders of both countries. The interview today welcomes a good friend, Peter Quilty, who will give us a blow-by-blow account of coming here, living, working and owning businesses, and the decision to return to the UK. And that's up next. But first... Thanks to all our sponsors, and especially David, Gerard, Phil and Tony for your support. You can join them by buying us a coffee at our website, www.timothydown.com, and pressing the sponsor button. If you want me to review a cafe, bar, or restaurant, you can also sponsor the visit. Better still, come over in person when it's safe and be part of the show. Without further delay and through the power of the internet, I will whisk you all back in time to last Wednesday and my second in-person interview. I just want to mention the opinions expressed here are our personal ones and are not connected to official tourist industry in any way. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are outside the Monte Cristo, and I'm with a good friend of mine and neighbour, and we're going to ask him a few questions about his life. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Peter Quilty. Hi, Peter, how are you? Very good afternoon to you, Tim. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I've got a few questions for you, if that's all right. Just fire away, my friend, fire away. Okay, here we go. So, my first question that I ask everybody is, how did you end up on the island, and what did you do before coming over? 
well, many, many years ago. I've actually been on the island 23 years this July. Uh, many years ago, before coming to Tenerife, I was a hotel manager. I was actually a publican in Nottingham for 20 years, known as Nottingham singing landlord. Um, but uh, before coming to prior to Tenerife, I was a hotel manager in Scotland, in Bonny, Scotland. Scotland? Whereabouts in Scotland were you? Well, I was in a, I had a hotel in uh, originally up in the Highlands in a place called Grantland, Spain. And then I managed a castle in Kim Fawn's Castle, which is in Perth. Uh, and then I moved to uh, a place called Calendar. Uh, the Dreadnought Hotel in Calendar, which is uh, known for the um, old television shows uh, that Dr. Finley's case book is the town of Calendar. Oh, I remember that, Dr. Finley's case book. Oh no, Dr. Finley! <laughs> 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 so what brought, you over to, <laughs> what brought you over to Tenerife? Well, what happened was I worked for a company that was, um, how can you put it? They used to uh, pay peanuts so they employ monkeys. And it was a terrible situation to be in. And this company uh, were no, known as North British Trust Hotels. And we used to deal a lot with uh, coach individuals, i.e. Wallace Arnold, David Ergot, Shearings, that sort of thing, which were all as cheap as chips, and everything you had to do was as cheap as chips. But the scenario was that they wanted, they wanted uh, um, a luxury product for a Woolworth price, if you understand my meaning. That sounds, that, yeah, I can understand that. And it got to a point where my wife and I, Jackie, being on holiday, we'd been all over on holiday, and every time we seemed to be on holiday in Spain, I'd always see a bar and I'd think to myself, one of these days I'm going to buy myself something like that. And uh, we went back to Calendar, there was a big, uh, to cut a long story short, a uh, big upheaval about um, an overbooking in the hotel. Sadly, I paid the ultimate price of getting the sack and uh, I took the company to court for wrongful dismissal, which I won because I'd, I hadn't done anything wrong. I hadn't overbooked the hotel they had. And, uh, and we'd been to Tenerife in the October before we took over the Dreadnought. And we were way up in a lovely place called Los Gigantes. And uh, at that time in the local newspaper, they were looking for somebody to run a pool bar uh, in Los Gigantes, in Las Rosas which then belonged to a company called Wimpen. And it was sort of franchise situation. And uh, I applied for it. I sat by the swimming pool, wrote my CV out and sent off and I applied for it. Sadly, I didn't actually get that one, but I was promised by the company, by Wimpen, that there was another one coming available in the December of that year. And if I was patient and just hang on, then I would get that. We went back to Scotland and that's when all the uh, upheaval happened and we packed everything up and we came out here and here I am and I've been here 23 years. Wow, so that was basically it was a dream that you'd had for a while and the opportunity arose yep. and you grasped it with both hands. We did, it was a, a scenario that um, I knew that the business that I was going to buy, I knew where it was. I couldn't tell anybody about it because it wouldn't come in uh, to known until the December. So what happened was, in the Harbour Club, where I stayed in uh, Los Gigantes, I made friends with a very good guy called Clifton Bird. Big friends with Clifton and Freddie both. They're two South African guys that ran the timeshare scenario in the Harbour Club. And Clifton always said to me, if ever you want a job in Tenerife, come and find me. And I did. And yes, I was one of those timeshare salesmen that strapped you in the chair and stuck the electrodes in you until you signed the paper. <laughs> um, but it was good. I had a good six months at doing that. But then in the December, I knew that the bar was coming. So I had to make this decision whether to carry on with the timeshare with Clifton or obviously to take the bar. So we took the bar, uh, which is here in Calial Salvaje. It's up in an area called Sueno Azul. And we took the pool bar there, up there, and uh, we had the pool bar in Sueno Azul for f four and a half years. And then uh, because of my contract coming to the end, with it being a, a franchise situation, not actually a trespasso situation, with it being a franchise, my contract had come to the end. 
and I wasn't really bothered about renewing it again because of the timeshare scenario up there and I bought myself a little restaurant which is just below where we're sitting now so or it was <laughs> yeah so we're up on a terrace now which is where the um, Monte Cristo is and there's an old barracuda bar which isn't the barracuda bar anymore there's a, a derelict Canarian restaurant which is all boarded up but if you go in the back door there's a private club and we're sat just outside the Three Horseshoes which is sort of a karaoke bar, uh, family bar, pool bar uh, with also live music I believe and just below there is this restaurant and what was the restaurant called? The restaurant was called Quilty's Hideaway my name obviously being Peter Quilty and the actual restaurant being where it is is tucked right at the back of this commercial centre so we called it Quilty his hideaway and uh, when we first opened the restaurant which was in the year 2000 it was a massive success it took off like a rocket it really did it took off so, it was so successful you had to book a table to get in my restaurant at the time then well that's the way to be isn't it yeah yeah it was, certainly was and uh, but sadly when the euro came in and the peseta went out Business was good, but then the euro started to decline, so therefore you were working just as hard, working the same hours, but for less money, because of the, de the decline in the value of the euro to the pound. So after five years of having the restaurant, we decided enough was enough. And I actually sold it back to the brother of the guy that I bought it off, and he still got it now to this day. And it's called now the Bodygon, it, I think. It's called the Bodygon Canaria, that's right. Bodygon Canaria. Yeah. So you don't have the restaurant anymore, Peter, so what happened then? Well, after the restaurant, I decided that um, I was going to semi-retire, but my wife, Jackie, had different ideas to that. And uh, I decided then what I would do is start myself off a little company, and I called myself the Galloping Gourmet, which was uh, a catering service. So if you had a chef that was not turned up or was poorly, I would do a relief chef. If you wanted a dinner party doing, I would do that for you. Uh, buffet, uh, business function, any type of function I can do, uh, as long as I'd got your premises to do it in. And uh, that's how I started doing it. And I finished up working for a gentleman by the name of Keith Gilding in a very famous restaurant here in Los Cristianos called The Roast House. And uh, the, uh, I got a phone call one night from Keith, who I'd known for some years, and uh, would I come and help? His chef had burnt his feet. He took a tray of meat out of the oven, and the overflow from the meat tray had spilt all over his feet, badly burnt his feet. So obviously he was going to be off for some considerable time with his feet. So I said, yeah, I'd come and help him. And uh, I finished up being on and off for Keith for two and a half years. <laughs> uh, carving, standing carving meat in the roast house. Uh, the roast house then was a very, very popular restaurant in Los Cristianos. I mean, on a Sunday, we could do anything over 500 covers on a Sunday, just uh, serving carvery, basically. Very, very busy restaurant. And as I say, I worked on and off for Keith and also, I was also then, um, I'd always been interested in radio, doing the radio. Whilst I was in Nottingham, I used to do a little bit for the BBC on a Friday night in BBC Radio Nottingham. I used to present a show called What's In and Around Nottingham on Friday. And I used to do that from my own pub. And then I'd go up to York House in Nottingham and, and actually record the show, etc., etc. And I got into radio here on the island with uh, Power FM uh, because whilst the Galloping Gourmet was good, not all the time was it was that busy. So I took on a role with Power FM as a uh, selling advertising. And not only did I sell the advertising, but I used to make the adverts with a guy called Hedy Hastings and we used to voice the adverts, sing the adverts etc. So again that became very very popular and then I started doing the radio, presenting a radio show on a uh, Saturday and Sunday. On a Saturday I'd do a sports show uh, which was called the Saturday Scene with Peter Quilton. I'd cover all the football and the major sporting events that were happening on that particular day, give you the results etc. But it was also combined with a very good music um, part of it 
and chitty chatter etc and then on Sunday I used to do a completely different show which was called the Sunday Roast and it was basically put down to uh, not a request show but you could request things we used to have a quiz etc 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 and all the music we played was would be from the 60s to the 90s not modern music not modern music as it was then but popular uh, music to be played. And what year was this? Well, sadly, Power FM went, uh, they pulled the plug on Power FM in 2010, and I went to work for John Maxfield, then at Atlantis FM, doing exactly the same format for John uh, for Atlantis FM, and his, his actual studios in Puerto Santiago. And we, I did exactly the same format for John for five years. I worked for John for five years. Uh, and then I, during that time, I'd started guiding coaches around the island, and uh, which I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed. It was one of the best jobs I've ever had in on this island, where I take people around. And we used to, I used to work for a company called Power Promotions. Maybe people that's listening or will listen to this, and perhaps you may have even bought a bed, because we used to bring people to Tenerife to sell you a bed. And we used to sell you a bed, but included in that um, actual sales pitch was a tour around the island. And I would take you around the island to tell you all about the island, that beautiful island of Tenerife. Take you up to places like Aguayo, where the volcanic eruption happened in 1706. And take you then down to Santiago del Tady to the lovely little church. And, Places like that take you all around this island. I knew more about bananas than bananas did at the time. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds fantastic. So were you driving the coaches as well? No, 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 no. I never had that privilege. <laughs> but it, it certainly brought my Spanish on uh, because obviously all the coach drivers, not one of the coach drivers, would speak English to you. So my Spanish really came on leaps and bounds whilst I was driving around these islands in some of these coaches. But uh, whether you've, uh, anybody's listeners actually driven around this island uh, some of the roads when you get up into the areas of Aguayo and places like that it uh, can be quite hair raising and when you're trying to swing a 56 seater coach around a certain bend then certain remarks come down from the back of the coach and I can't repeat them but uh, certain remarks would come <laughs> whistling down Woo, bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I've been uh, I've been up a couple of those roads and yeah. I wouldn't like to be on a coach it was bad enough being in the car and driving yeah even worse for me I was sat at the front with the driver <laughs> so <laughs> you, you, we got the uh, first hand uh, but I always used to say to a certain area in Tamaimo which is a place that you all know and there's a certain uh, set of bends before you enter the village of Tamaimo and I always used to say on the coach, if we were coming in from the uh, Gia di Isura road, I used to say, if you're sitting on the left-hand side of the coach and you are of a nervous disposition, as the driver turns this corner, look right, because it's a long way down, down there. And it used to be a sheer drop right down. You could see the town of Los Gigantes away below us, etc., etc. Uh, quite hair-raising moments, I can assure you. So very impressive scenes, I believe. Oh, sounds fantastic. The people who listen to this show are really interested in... Um, in what it was like uh, when you heard about the lockdown and how did it affect you personally? Right, well what happened was basically that my wife Jackie and myself had made the decision after 23 years that we were going to return to the UK. This came just after Christmas of the, this year when we made the decision due to family uh, my wife Jackie had suffered a, a very slight heart murmur type of thing uh, which sort of uh, put her on edge etc. My daughter Nicola had just had a new grandson and our other granddaughter Frances was just growing up our other two grandsons who we don't see much of uh, growing up and all of a sudden we realised that perhaps after 23 years we've had enough and perhaps it is time to return home and uh, my wife uh, also lost her little job my wife Jackie worked on the telephones again bringing people to this island for holidays 
but as the sort of uh, the timeshare industry dried up as it so to speak uh, sadly Jackie was one of these people that obviously uh, lost her job through that the moment she lost her job that was when we said right that is it we're going home so the decision was then made that was made in uh, in the February yeah and we decided that that was it we were going home we, we discussed it with the children where would we go our daughter lives in Southampton my son lives in Durham so to live in Southampton is a very expensive area to live in in Hampshire uh, so we decided that we would go back to Durham. I'm actually from Nottingham myself, but my wife Jackie did not want to go back to the city of Nottingham. So we decided on Durham, everything was set up and we got all organised. We even, uh, we have a little dog um, called Tito, who's a little Yorkshire Terrier, who's sadly very poorly at this moment in time. And I just lost my other little dog that you'd remember, the little white one, after 18 and a half years. Sadly, he uh, said goodbye. And that sort of put another uh, nail in the coffin, if you want to put it in that respect. But we were ready to go back. So it was all set up to go. We'd paid for the flights uh, with Chewy to uh, depart this island on the 31st of March. And uh, sadly, this all happened to us. Everything is packed in boxes. I have boxes everywhere in my apartment. All our home is packed in boxes. We sold quite a lot of the stuff off that obviously we weren't going to take back with us because we're only taking X amount back with us. Uh, so sadly, that was that's how the uh, scenario finished up. So the moment lockdown came, everything stopped. And here I am, still am, <laughs> still waiting uh, to hear. But like a lot of other people, perhaps I'm in the right place to be at this moment in time. So you're not actually an old age pensioner then? Well, I'm, the, I'm, I'm coming up to the magic age of 70 this year, I am. So I'm 70 this year. In fact, next week, I've actually been married 50 years as well, next weekend. I've been married 50 years to Jackie. Congratulations next, for next week. Yeah, so, well, that was, again, these were things that we were hoping to celebrate <laughs> with the family back in the UK, but sadly not to be. I think personally, um, because of the situation in the UK at the moment and this lockdown situation, that we're in the right place for this moment in time and uh, even if it now doesn't happen till august then so be it you know so so you can stay till august i mean i you're looking so young peter i didn't realize that you hadn't retired <laughs> yet so oh, thanks for the compliment man. Uh, no problem no problem <laughs> so let's carry on so peter big question do you think the tourism is gonna stay the same or is it changed forever well i think tim being as i was involved with tourism over so many years after selling my restaurant and moving out getting getting rid of the business etc being involved in excursions and boat trips and trips around the island etc etc that because of the lockdown scenario that's all stopped dead and it hit me quite hard a few uh, about a fortnight ago I actually took my wife Jackie back into Las Americas to have her nails done and whilst Jackie was having her nails done I sort of had a wander around the, in Las Americas and it struck me right to the core the hotels boarded up and not a soul in the place like a ghost town Las Americas you could park a car anywhere you wanted to park a car in Las Americas in the height of the season here as you well know no way can you do that but it is a crying shame to see this scenario and i do hope but i'm seriously thinking it's going to take a good 12 months for this thing to get back on its feet and that's even if they open the doors up again and say right you can go back uh, to the british tourists tourists in general not just british tourists when they'd be coming in from the uh, Europe, wherever they're coming from, but it's uh, I think it'll hit a lot of people very very hard There'll be a lot of Financial difficulties for people on this island at this moment in time And I'm, I'm so glad I don't have to have a I don't have a business Now because I would be a very worried man if I would well that brings me to another question and What advice would you give anybody who wants to move over here to work? And what advice would you give everybody, if anything, uh, to come over and buy a business? 
Well, I wouldn't, anybody wishing to come here, if you've got the youth on your side, etc., then by all means, it's a beautiful place to live. It's a lovely climate, although it does get very hot here in the summer, but we have fabulous winter months where the weather is absolutely superb. It's a very beautiful island to work with, to work on. But if you're gonna to come to work on the island of Tenerife, make sure that you've geared yourself up ready for it. Come with a profession. Don't just come on a whim that you're gonna find work because you won't find work and if you do find work it's going to be very low paid uh, because also people we contract etc etc as it works out here um, it's very difficult to get the right job for the right money unless you're in a specialized profession then so be it but I wouldn't say to anybody don't give it a try as far as a bar or a restaurant or anything within the uh, that sort of industry I would think very much twice about it because there will be a lot of cheap businesses going for sale in the very near future because some of these bars and restaurants just will not open the doors again so what I've uh, heard is that the people who own the buildings can sell a lease for five years every three years that's correct yeah it's called a trespasso they sell here now and Unless you actually own freehold property, if you own freehold, then you're, you're a very lucky pe person. But the people that do hold, like you just said, that, ho that own these properties and sell the leases on, uh, hold the upper hand against you all the time, you know. So, but I wouldn't say don't do it, but please don't do it at this moment in time. Don't ever you dream about it. Stay where you are. <laughs> okay, so I mean that's a positive thing, you know, if you've got a plan and you've got a profession then come over and do it, but if you're coming over on a whim, it's probably not the right time to do it. Okay, we're coming to the end now, Peter, I want to thank you very much, but I want to ask, uh, what are your future plans and is there anybody you want to say hi to? Well, my future plans are uh, again set in, uh, in hold at the moment, but the moment I walk back into the UK, uh, I have a job. I'm going to work for Morrison's uh, in a place called Chester Lily Street, which is up in, the, in County Durham, because I'm actually a butcher by trade. I was a butcher from leaving school. I did a five-year butcher's apprenticeship. I had two shops of my own way back in the, uh, in the 80s. Uh, so, but butchering is a bit like cooking and riding a bike and once you've done it you know what you're doing and because we were going back to the lockdown scenario we were going back I actually applied to Morrison's for a job and I thought well they might be looking for a part-time butcher and yes they are looking for a part-time butcher and they actually sent me an email could I uh, appear at Chesley Street store on the 6th of July to start my new job <laughs> but sadly I'm not going to be there I don't think but they do understand and they've uh, said to, just to let them know when I actually get back into the UK so I'm quite looking forward to doing that but I only want to, I don't want to work a big uh, 40 hour week etc three days a week will do me fine as long as it pays for my beer around the golf and keeps the car on the road that's all I'm bothered about. That sounds like a great plan, Peter. Great plan. <laughs> and uh, is anybody going to say hi to you before we finish? Well, I'd just like to say uh, a big, big thank you to a lot. Not uh, hi to anybody individuals, but I have a lot of pals and people that I've known over 23 years. And I'd like to say a big thank you to some of them that got me going in certain areas, i.e. the radio, etc., etc. And people that have known me for many, many years. People that obviously came to my restaurant and my pool bar it. And they're the people that I have uh, the utmost respect for and admiration and always will have. They'll always be in my heart somewhere along the line. Uh, but most of them, for obviously, my wife Jackie, who's now obviously looking so much forward to getting back to the UK, to the kids and the grandkids. And 23 years, fabulous years here on the island of Tenerife, but now is the time, I think. Peter Quilty, on that note, I'd like to thank you very, very much. And thank you for a wonderful story. I mean, it's heart-rending, heartbreaking, <laughs> all at the same time. And uh, I want to see you uh, enjoy yourself in UK. And, um, and we'll keep in touch. We'll keep in touch. Certainly will. Thank see you very you. much indeed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Vamos a la playa. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. 
There's a great story from Peter Quilty. I've got a few interviews set up for next week, but uh, I don't know which one I'm going to publish next Sunday, so stay tuned for that, the mystery. And, of course, a lot of things are going to happen. Uh, tomorrow, depending on when you're listening to this, uh, I'm going to meet again with the Mac Master, and uh, we're going to have a chit-chat there, so we will publish that, I assume, uh, during the week. And also, uh, thank you for tuning in. Don't forget, I publish every Sunday night on my podcast, and you can access the podcast all over the place in Apple, Google, Spotify. Um, check out our website, www.timothydow.com. And we'll see you on the next one. This is Timothy Dow. Goodbye.